good afternoon all and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce dr uh, mayor kinos papalias uh, from the materials department at university of birmingham mayor kinos is currently working as a reader and leading a research group in uh, non destructive testing and condition monitoring he has been involved as a technical coordinator and scientific officer in several fp6 and fp7 horizon 2020 research projects in addition to european projects he has been funded by epsrc industry as well as uk government he is the other and co-author of uh, more than 150 uh, journal articles as well as articles in conferences in uh, national and international conferences in ndt and he has edited for edited uh, four books on this uh, subject as well today mayor kinos is going to deliver a talk on the principles and applications of electromagnetic sensors mayor kinos thank you very much for your time and the floor is yours so we'll start off with uh, magnetic flux leakage which uh, as i said earlier it is the uh, earliest electromagnetic method uh, for inspection of uh, ferrous materials. This uh, technique uh, requires that we magnetize the sample, so it has to be ferrous. Uh, it cannot work with uh, simply conductive materials. It ha they, as, unless they are uh, uh, capable of being magnetized, then this technique is not applicable. So this uh, technique uh, is based on the creation of a magnetic uh, circuit, and that requires very powerful uh, permanent magnets or uh, DC electromagnets in order to enable uh, this method to uh, be applied for the inspection of uh, ferrous materials and ferrous components. Uh, the idea behind this uh, technique is the saturation with uh, magnetic flux of the material we want to inspect. In theory, if there is no uh, defect uh, that causes any flux to leak, then we can extrapolate that this material is free of defects or the defects that it is uh, containing are not uh, severe enough to give uh, a measurable response. So if we have a defect uh, of appropriate orientation and appropriate severity, then flux will leak and hopefully this should be detected by the sensors that are incorporated together with the magnets that generate the magnetic circuit. This can be done either using coils in the most uh, simple uh, type of sensor or uh, more often in modern equipment using hole probes. Of course, we can use other uh, sensing, uh, sensing uh, tech, uh, instruments such as GMR, but at the moment commercial systems tend to include uh, hole probes instead. So the principle of magnetic flux leakage is based on uh, magnetizing the sample, as I said earlier. And of course, in order to magnetize it, it has to be uh, ferromagnetic. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, the series of uh, schematic diagrams. You can see how the flux uh, uh, distributes itself uh, when we have no uh, ferromagnetic component uh, in the vicinity where the, flux, uh, uh, the, where the flux field is present. And then when we have a pipeline, which is uh, defect free, then uh, the sample will be magnetized, but no uh, flux leakage or no sufficient flux leakage will occur in order to give us a measurable signal. In the case where we have uh, corrosion or uh, a crack defect which causes enough uh, leakage to occur, then some of the flux will leak. And of course, that is what we are going to try to detect with our whole probes with, or with our coils. Now, very important, however, is to take into account the level of magnetization. So if the level of magnetization is not sufficient, then we may not have uh, leakage occurring at all, which means uh, defects can be missed or they can be underestimated. The same can be the case when we have medium magnetization. So the leakage may be uh, limited and that, of course, will lead either to this defect being missed or it will lead to this defect being underestimated. So it is required that we have sufficient magnetization or high level magnetization in order to ensure that uh, sufficient magnetic flux is leaking. And of course, that can be related to the actual severity. 
That is why when we are doing the inspection in the field, we need to calibrate uh, our system for the liftoff that we are operating because the liftoff will, of course, affect the level of magnetization. So if we haven't done that, that means that we are getting wrong ind indications and that can lead to missing defects altogether or even worse, underestimating defects. It's uh, very important to ensure that defects that are detected are uh, uh, satisfactorily uh, uh, assessed and not underestimated because that can lead to erroneous conclusion. So in the NDT industry, we have uh, uh, a saying that uh, suggests that it is better not to inspect something at all rather than inspect something and think that it is uh, in the right condition or in a better condition that is actually uh, in reality. So it is very important that uh, everything is calibrated correctly and of course the severity of the defects is correctly assessed. Here you can see another plot which uh, shows uh, the magnetic flux leakage response for different types of defects, but also at different speeds. So the purple trace uh, is uh, the inspection carried out at 2.5 uh, miles per hour, and uh, the blue trace is at 8 miles per hour. So here you can see that uh, the response for the higher speed inspection is uh, somewhat reduced, even though the defects are mostly detectable uh, in both cases. But the response, the amplitude of the response is lower in the second case. And this is because of uh, the eddy current effects, which uh, are caused by the fact that the probe is moving faster along the um, uh, component that uh, we are inspecting but also we are beginning to distort the magnetic uh, field. So some of the flux is lagging behind, uh, distorted uh, from where the sensors are, and that results again in uh, somewhat lower, uh, um, lower signal being, um, uh, being detected by the sensing instruments of the magnetic flux, flux leakage device. Now, what are the applications that we typically use magnetic flux leakage? So we tend to use them on uh, plates, tubes, and pipes. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, all of these uh, components have to be ferromagnetic, so they have to be typically made of uh, carbon or uh, uh, carbon steel or carbon manganese steel uh, in order to uh, enable the magnetization of these of these uh, components. Nickel and uh, ferro-stainless steel, ferro -stainless steel grades are also inspectable with magnetic flux leakage. Uh, the majority of the applications, of course, relate to plate, uh, tubes, and pipes, as I mentioned earlier. And it is very common to inspect air cooler and heat exchanger tubes using this method. So we push the magnetic flux leakage probe through the tube, and then as we retrieve it, we take the measurement and we look at the signals in order to see whether there is any pitting or general corrosion or erosion that has affected these, uh, these tubes. The same uh, can be done for uh, uh, pipes, uh, but uh, it is also feasible to do the inspection from the outer layer, provided that the pipe is not excessively, uh, the wall thickness is not excessively uh, great. So in that case, we can magnetize the entire um, uh, thickness of the of the of the pipe, and we can again detect corrosion or erosion that may have affected the interior of of the pipe. In the case of uh, uh, plates, it is quite common to use MFL for uh, oil storage tanks in refineries. So it's one of the classic methods we use to assess uh, these these plates for uh, corrosion uh, and pitting corrosion specifically. And uh, occasionally, we also use it for uh, plates in uh, SIPs. So SIPs uh, are also occasionally inspected with, with MFL. It is not uh, a regular type of inspection, but occasionally, especially in tankers, it is one of the methods that is applied uh, in order to rapidly assess the level of corrosion. In uh, the case of uh, MFL, the advantage is that uh, despite the fact that we don't have accurate quantification, we have the capability of uh, getting a good qualitative uh, assessment uh, 
and we can get some uh, semi-quantitative uh, uh, idea of uh, the uh, defect severity. Uh, the other advantage is that it does not require excessive cleaning, which is the case for ready current testing due to the higher sensitivity that uh, this method has with liftoff. So with MFL, we can uh, uh, do the inspection with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, inferior uh, level of cleaning, but we do have to take into account that uh, any uh, changes in the distance between the probe and the test piece can result in signals that are not uh, true, so we have to, to ignore them. Now, with traditional uh, instruments, this can be very quickly uh, recognized when we do the inspection because these instruments do, do not have the capability of storing the information digitally. You just store, you just uh, 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 write down on the piece itself what kind of defect has been detected and whether additional inspection is required. In uh, modern instruments that uh, have uh, digitization of the data and uh, use special software in order to uh, 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 view the uh, inspection results and also uh, store them for further analysis later on, we have to be more careful in how we pinpoint these locations that some uh, level of change in the liftoff may have occurred. So, as I said earlier, MFL has restrictions in defect sizing capability. It is a more qualitative and at best semi-quantitative method rather than quantitative. The signal amplitude is affected by the pooling speed, so we have to ensure that there are no variations when we do the inspection. We have to do the inspection at consistent speed, and of course that speed has to be uh, uh, somewhat limited. It is a relatively uh, fast method, but obviously we cannot uh, uh, move the probe too fast because that will increase the eddy current effect and uh, will change the sensitivity level of uh, the uh, uh, inspection uh, that we are doing. It is generally a better method for detecting rather than sizing. Typically, speeds uh, up to one meter per second are uh, feasible with manual inspection. With uh, test vehicles, we can, uh, we can uh, achieve higher speeds, maybe as high as 10 kilometers an hour, maybe even 15, but uh, no more than that because we will have other issues that uh, will need to be overcome. And the effective uh, instrument is uh, based on two permanent magnets, which are coupled to a steel core, and then they are used to magnetize the sample or the tube wall until saturation is achieved, and then any flux leaking will be what, uh, will, de what will be detected. In tubes, we have to use three sensing coils. Uh, one is the absolute coil, and the other two are the differential coils. The absolute coil is designed to detect uh, general corrosion. The differential coils are designed to detect beating corrosion and are more sensitive to smaller defects. Theoretically, we can also detect cracks, but uh, MFL uh, has restrictions in, uh, in uh, crack sensitivity and uh, the orientation of the crack and its location will affect uh, its detectability. So typically, uh, it has to be transverse, the orientation of the crack with respect to the flux lines, because if it's, if it's lying longitudinal, then the flux leaking will be too low and will probably go undetected. So two cracks of the same size, depending on their orientation, can be uh, the difference in detecting them or not detecting them. So as I said earlier, in uh, MFL, we have uh, two types of coils. The absolute mode coil is employed for wall for uh, general wall loss uh, uh, instead of the differential coils. The differential coils are the ones that are used uh, for the smaller defects, for the pitting corrosion and potentially for cracks. The magnets are typically based on uh, rare F, so neodymium iron boron or samarium cobalt are the types of magnets that are typically used. Of course, uh, there is the alternative that uh, employs DC magnets or DC electromagnets in the place of the rare F magnets, but this usually results in a bulkier probe, which also uh, requires that the DC coil uh, that generates the electromagnetic field 
uh, is energized somehow. So that is an additional uh, problem that we have to address during the inspection. Of course, apart from corrosion, we can also detect erosion. Uh, of course, during the inspection itself, it may not be possible to differentiate between the two. So it depends on what the test piece is, whether we can recognize whether it's erosion, corrosion, or combination of both, or because we can have erosion, corrosion uh, defects affecting certain components. And of course, with experience, this can be um, uh, anticipated when we do the inspection. So we can anticipate certain types of defects uh, due to uh, previous knowledge that we have gained with time. This is uh, uh, a graph, uh, sorry, a diagram that shows the positions of the different coils uh, when we are inspecting tubes. So we have the absolute coil in the center, and then we have the differential coils on uh, the side, which are uh, responsible, as I said earlier, for detecting smaller defects. The differential coils are usually generating signals that are subtracted from one another. So if there is any difference in the reading of one coil, then that will give us a difference to the uh, subtracted uh, uh, value, the subtracted sum of the two coils, and that will be our signal. In some cases, it can be in addition, but the most common approach involves the two differential coils uh, subtracting the value from each other. The factors that can influence inspection in uh, magnetic flux leakage with magnetic flux leakage include the sudden changes in speed, which can yield uh, data that appear to be uh, real defects. But of course, if we are doing the inspection, we can realize when we have done this, uh, if we, especially if we have enough experience. The differential coils uh, are not designed to pick up uh, general corrosion because their values will eventually go back to zero when we are subtracting each other. Uh, typically, what we can do with the differential coils is identify the ends of general corrosion, so where it starts and when it finishes, because that's the point where the value instantaneously would change. Uh, so with differential coils, we can find the ends, but we typically miss the in-between uh, level of uh, uh, wall loss, and that's why the absolute coil is uh, uh, required as well. These are uh, some examples of uh, magnetic flux leakage. So here you can see uh, pipe inspection with a handheld instrument. Handheld instruments are not that common. More common are the trolleys, like the ones you see on the two photographs here. On the right hand side, you can see uh, a more traditional MFL instrument. So this is not a, digital, a digital system. Uh, it gives you a reading that you need to identify while you are doing the inspection, and then you need to dot down on the plate that is being inspected the defect that you believe you have found. The um, bottom left-hand side shows a more modern instrument. Uh, this one in particular is from Silverwing, uh, and of course that is using a digital uh, uh, software, so it can uh, record the data and create a map without uh, requiring to note down the details on the plate of the storage tank. But uh, even with that instrument, usually you will still do, uh, you will still be required by the infrastructure manager to note down any defects that you have uh, identified because it's easy for them to know where to look uh, for later when they do the maintenance. Handheld instruments are not as so common as I said. It is typically the trolleys that we use. And of course, we can use MFL for inspection in uh, railways. So it's one of the classic approaches for uh, railhead inspection uh, for rolling, con rolling contact fatigue defects, as well as defects that lie in the railhead or in the top part of the railhead, because as we go deeper, the magnetic flux does not penetrate, and of course, that doesn't allow us to inspect uh, um, other parts of the rail or the bottom part of the rail head. Now we'll move to anti-current uh, anti testing and its fundamentals. So as I said uh, previously for MFL, it is not feasible to use MFL in non-ferrous materials, and that's where anti-current testing uh, comes in. So anti-current testing is applicable for both. Uh, ferrous and non-ferrous materials as long as they are conducted. In uh, principle, the eddy current testing is based on the creation uh, 
of the, an alternating electromagnetic field. And uh, uh, when this electromagnetic field is changing, it will result in eddy currents induced in a conductor when we bring this electromagnetic field close to it. So if there is no defect, these uh, eddy currents will just flow uh, in a regular pattern depending on the coil shape that we have used. And uh, that uh, these eddy currents will generate a secondary field which will remain undisturbed. However, if we have a defect, these eddy currents will be disrupted, their uh, shape will be disrupted, and of course that will give changes to the alternating, uh, to the secondary electromagnetic field, which will give us the changes in the impedance of the coil, and that will be the signal that we will detect from uh, the presence of a defect. Of course, very important in eddy current testing is the uh, distance from the test piece. So we have to ensure that uh, the inspection is taking place at uh, uh, a, a steady liftoff and uh, preferably as close as possible to the test piece. Usually no more than one millimeter, maybe two millimeters max. Above that, the response the, is uh, reduced quite a lot. And of course, that results in a very poor signal to noise ratio. The typical eddy current testing applications uh, include, of course, crack detection. It can be used for corrosion detection as well uh, and pitting corrosion. Uh, material thickness measurements, uh, which are related to corrosion, erosion, as well as for uh, geometrical analysis. Coating thickness measurements. So, for example, in steel uh, turbine blades, uh, we have uh, special thermal barrier coatings that uh, it is almost impossible to inspect uh, in some cases. And one way of doing this inspection is by applying eddy current, uh, eddy current testing because the um, degradation of the coating barrier, uh, thermal barrier, will uh, result in some changes in the relative magnetic permeability to which eddy current testing will be extremely sensitive. So if we are picking up uh, permeability, vari permeability related vari variations, that means that our uh, uh, thermal barrier coating is degrading and that can be quantified actually. Of course, we can also take into account conductivity measurements for material and microstructure and identification. But apart from conductivity, we can also uh, take into account permeability variations, which is what we use when we want to uh, monitor phase transformation in steels. We can, we can use the current testing for heat damage detection, for case depth determination, as well as heat treatment monitoring based on the conductivity and the permeability variations that will arise from these uh, techniques. Of course, in order to quantify them uh, or semi-quantitatively assess them, we need to have calibration uh, measurements beforehand. Otherwise, we are blind and we cannot really say exactly what is the amount of uh, phase that has formed in a particular material or a particular grade. So we need to know uh, uh, already from a calibration set of measurements that we can compare against uh, what our measurement is showing. This is uh, a set of schematic diagrams that shows the current testing principles. So as I said earlier, we, in the most basic uh, scenario, we have a coil which is fed with an AC current. This yields an AC, this generates an AC electromagnetic field, which when it is near a conductor, will cause eddy currents to flow close to the surface of the conductor. These eddy currents will result in a secondary electromagnetic field to be generated. And of course, that will change the impedance of the coil. And if we have the presence of defect, the uh, flow of the eddy currents will be disrupted. And that means that the secondary electromagnetic field will also be uh, changing in shape and magnitude. And that will give rise to changes in impedance. What we have to take into account when we are doing eddy current inspection is the empirical equation that relates the penetration depth of the inspection with uh, uh, the frequency the conductivity of the test piece and the relative magnetic permeability. So in the case of uh, uh, non-ferrous materials, we can ignore uh, mu uh, 
So mu will not uh, play a role. It's just the conductivity and the frequency that we need to take into account. So the higher the frequency, the higher the conductivity, the lower the depth will be. In the case of a ferrous uh, material, the relative magnetic permeability will have a value which is different to one. And that means that uh, it will also play uh, a role to the depth that we are inspecting with the current testing. So the higher the relative permeability, the lower the depth of the inspection. Generally, the uh, inspection when we are inspecting ferrous materials, it's much uh, has a much lower depth in comparison with uh, non-ferrous materials because of the very large effect that the relative permeability has in the depth of the penetration. And this can be visualized also on uh, the right hand side uh, set of schematic diagrams where you can see that the uh, uh, high frequency, high conductivity, high permeability uh, restricts the de restrict the depth of the eddy currents. In the case of uh, lower frequency, lower conductivity, lower permeability, the depth is increasing accordingly. Uh, this empirical equation uh, can be used to evaluate uh, what kind of frequency we need to apply for a particular inspection, or it can be taken into account in order to enable us to ensure that we know which part of the test piece we have actually inspected. In most cases, it will be close to the surface, especially if we are dealing with steel uh, grades which have a high relative permeability. In non-ferrous materials, it is feasible to inspect the entire thickness of the sample, especially in uh, aerospace components, which are not uh, thick anyway. But in uh, ferrous materials, it's a different story because the relative magnetic permeability has a very strong effect. And you can see here from uh, this uh, schematic, this plot, uh, what is the relationship between the uh, operational frequency and the depth of inspection in, uh, in different materials, in titanium, in aluminum, in copper, and steel. Steel, as I said, has the lowest uh, depth of penetration because of the relative permeability effect, the relative magnetic permeability effect. Copper uh, has a bigger depth of inspection, but uh, it is also lower than aluminum and titanium, and this is because of its higher conductivity. And correspondingly, aluminum is the next uh, 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 material that we can inspect in depth for a particular frequency followed by titanium, which has the lowest conductivity of uh, these three conductors. Steel, as I said, is also uh, ferromagnetic, so it's the ferromagnetic uh, behavior that dominates. In the classic uh, approach, eddy current testing is uh, looking at the impedance plane. So we see how the impedance uh, of the coil changes. And uh, since the impedance has uh, three um, uh, characteristic uh, uh, inputs, we need to take into account resistance, inductive reactance, and uh, capacitive reactance. However, because we are dealing with a coil, we can consider that the capacitive reactance is, uh, has a negligible value or is equal to zero. So we can exclude that, and that leaves us with the resistance of the coil and the inductive reactance, or the in resistance of the circuit, if you prefer, and the inductant, inductive reactance of the circuit. In the case of the inductive reactance, uh, with respect to the uh, resistance, this is uh, 90 degrees out of phase, and that is why the equation that relates to the impedance of the coil can be related to the square root of uh, the square of the inductive reactance plus the square of the real resistance of the circuit. Of course, uh, in uh, classic instruments, uh, we use uh, uh, coils in order to detect uh, electromagnetic field variations. In uh, more advanced systems, it is possible to use hole probes or even better GMR-based sensors, even though we have to take into account the orientation of the field with respect to the orientation, uh, with the respect to the position of the sensor. But in theory, GMR sensors can achieve much higher sensitivity in comparison with the coil, uh, perhaps up to a thousand times more sensitive than normal eddy current probes. And of course, that means we can increase the signal to noise ratio 
as I said, in industrial instruments, uh, it is always a coil that is used instead. So, or in very rare cases, whole probes. So GMRs are uh, predominantly at the moment restricted to experimental configurations, which are not uh, as of yet used by the industry, even though GMRs have been, have been around for uh, a good 20 years plus, uh, but uh, with limited uh, uh, industrial application. However, this uh, can potentially increase the sensitivity of eddy current testing to very, very small uh, levels and uh, potentially even enabling them to detect increments of drag growth. Um, of course, uh, the in conventional eddy current testing, the sensitivity is related, or the resolution, if you prefer, is related to uh, the uh, size of the coil. So the size of the coil with respect to the defect size are related to uh, the sensitivity uh, of the instrument. Here are some photographs that show examples of current testing. So this uh, on the left hand side shows the use of current testing for the inspection of uh, uh, tubes in heat exchangers. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, uh, different components being inspected with a handheld device. In the case of the left hand side instrument, it is very, very important to have access throughout the entire length of the, of the tube. So we need to ensure that the tube is clean so we can push the probe inside and then retrieve it uh, on the way out when we take the measurement. Of course, the current testing can be used for uh, detection of phase transformation, as I said earlier, and uh, that uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, interesting because we can actually uh, detect uh, uh, phase transformation in steel uh, in environments which is very difficult to extrapolate this, form this information with different means, for example, such as pyrometers. So the idea is uh, to detect uh, the permeability variations that arise uh, when we are below the Curie temperature. So as long as the steel has uh, a temperature which is below the Curie temperature of that grade, if any ferrous phase has formed, that will enable us to detect it with such an electromagnetic detector, provided that there are no significant lift of variations as the plate or strip is moving along uh, above and along the path of the uh, cooling bed. Of course, <laughs> the conductivity effects will play a role, but uh, they will have a lower effect in comparison to the permeability variations. So even though conductivity variations have a measurable and detectable effect, in ferrous materials, it's the permeability that dominates the signal. However, we can still take conductivity-related readings that enable us to a certain extent extrapolate at what temperature our strip is at a particular stage of cooling. Uh, so uh, it is very important to recognize the importance of conductivity, but we also have to take into account that the dominant uh, effect relates to the relative magnetic permeability. So the more the relative permeability, uh, the relative magnetic permeability increases, the lower the significance of, of conductivity will be. In the case of phase transformation, because phase transformation will not happen uh, necessarily throughout the entire uh, uh, thickness or the entire uh, area of the test piece simultaneously, we do have to take into account contiguity related effects. So how the microstructure is forming, uh, whether it's ferritic, whether it's perlitic, whether it's uh, martensitic, where things will happen even much faster or bainitic again happening faster than in the case of uh, ferritoperlytic transformation. Uh, so, uh, of course, the depth of the inspection will depend on uh, the um, conductivity and relative permeability values. So when the phase transformation occurs, we have to take into account that the um, depth that we're inspecting is also changing with time. So we have to take this effect into account. Condition monitoring is also feasible with the current testing. We can use conventional eddy current probes, or we can use GMR-based uh, probes, which are mounted on the component on a permanent basis in an area of interest, such as a riveted area, for example, a riveted component. And then we can monitor these coils or uh, GMRs continuously to assess any crack initiation and crack propagation. This can be fed to a processing and uh, uh, analysis unit, which is local, before being 
relate to a supervisory control and uh, uh, data center uh, where the data are stored and analyzed uh, uh, all together from a set of nodes that we have used to instrument potentially different components and not just a single one. And that brings us to ACFM. So alternating current field measurement is, uh, as I said earlier, a different flavor of eddy current testing. The technique is based on the principle of uh, an alternating current being induced to flow in the thin skin near the surface of any conductor, or the thin skin theory uh, that I mentioned earlier that was developed by uh, UCL uh, physicists and engineers back in the 1980s. So here what we um, uh, want is to achieve a remote uh, uniform current field, which uh, if there is no defect will flow undisturbed. If there is a defect, then lines will be distorted flowing from the edges and under the uh, defect giving us different uh, uh, electrom giving us variations in the electromagnetic field that is arising from this uniform current. So this is ideal for detecting surface breaking defects. So ACFM is designed for uh, surface breaking assessments, uh, surface breaking defect assessments rather than defects that are hidden below the surface. In theory, it is feasible to also inspect below the surface, but this requires specialized experimental configurations, which are not really used by the industry. So in the industry, it is only used for surface breaking defects. Now, uh, we already mentioned this. So when a crack is present, the uniform current field will be distorted and uh, some of the lines will uh, deviate from the sides and uh, other, flag, other uh, current lines will uh, uh, dive deeper and go below uh, the crack. Uh, so this will give rise to changes in the uh, electromagnetic to the corresponding electromagnetic field, both in the Z component and in the X component, because the flux is a, a vector quantity and it's three dimensional. So we have uh, X, Z and Y uh, orientations that are of interest. And uh, the Z orientation is the one that relates to the surface uh, uh, current lines that are flowing around the edge of the crack. And the BX is the one that is going below uh, the uh, crack, uh, so it, it penetrates deeper in the material. This is the schematic diagram that shows the ACFM principle. So you can see here the BZ, corresponding BZ signal for the anti-clockwise flow and the clockwise flow uh, around the crack edges, and the BX signal uh, reduction for the current lines that are flowing at the bottom of the crack. The probes uh, are available in different uh, uh, geometries, different uh, configurations. So the simplest type of probe is a pencil probe, like in anti-current testing, but in modern inspection, we can also use uh, arrays. The same app is applicable for anti-current uh, instruments, which nowadays, instead of a single probe, can use uh, an array of coils uh, which enable us to cover a larger area and uh, with better um, uh, better uh, inspection quality overall. The ACFM does not require electrical contact in the same way that eddy current testing and uh, magnetic flux leakage do not require electrical contact. And they can also operate at uh, higher liftoff than eddy current testing. So typically, uh, liftoffs up to five millimeters are possible especially if we are trying to detect larger defects. If it's smaller defects, of course, we need to try to be as close as possible. Uh, Eddy current testing, however, above two millimeters becomes very, uh, the signal becomes very low. So it is not a very uh, good idea to try and increase the lift of beyond that. And ideally you should keep it even below one millimeter if feasible. In the case of ACFM, we can, uh, of course, try to bring our probe as close as possible, but we can live with uh, higher liftoffs, provided, uh, like in eddy current testing and in MFL, we don't have lift of variations because this will result in signals that look like true, true defects, which are not really uh, um, uh, related to real damage, and they are artificial. Uh, there are artifacts in the measurement. Uh, in the case of uh, sizing of defects, uh, this is based on the theory developed by. Louis, Michael, Lag, and Collins when they were in uh, UCL. Uh, 
so the idea is to relate the length and the depth with the BZ and BX responses. In, reali in reality, however, uh, the calculations have already been carried out uh, during tests in the lab. So these uh, signals have been uh, uh, calibrated and also they have been related to calculations based on the mathematics that have been developed in the thin skin theory. Uh, but when we use the actual instrument, uh, uh, the instrument does not, or the software of the instrument does not uh, recalculate the signals. Instead, it goes in a lookup table and it compares the signal we have obtained to what is already uh, available in the lookup table as a calibration. So there are no further calculations incorporated in the actual industrial system. It is already uh, loaded with the lookup table that uh, the signals that we obtain in the, in the field are compared with. This is a typical SEFM uh, instrument. This is the previous generation. Now we have Amigo 2 that uh, Edify is uh, commercializing. Uh, this is the classic old instrument uh, that uh, uh, some organizers are still using, including ourselves. We have one of these uh, in Birmingham. So this is the uh, control unit on the right hand side that uh, excites the probe. The left hand side is the computer that uh, co contains the software and uh, logs the data and compares them with the lookup table I mentioned earlier. We have the calibration plate uh, to co confirm that everything is working as, as it should. And then you can see the different types of probes, uh, pencil probes, and array and so it should be used for different types of inspection depending on our uh, requirements and uh, the geometry of the component that we want to inspect. ACFM applications are quite uh, uh, widespread, so it can be used in oil and gas, it can be used for air inspection, for power generation, for nuclear power, uh, and typically it is a good uh, alternative to magnetic particle inspection because it offers a higher probability of detection. Uh, so it is quite common to inspect uh, welds for surface breaking defects uh, with this method instead of MPI. When, of course, the instrument is available because MPI is uh, a more readily available technique, even though it doesn't offer the same sensitivity with, with ACFM. With ACFM, we have conducted uh, a number of uh, experiments uh, in uh, as part of an EPSRC project as well as a European project a few years back. So we did tests uh, in Birmingham up to 121 and a half kilometers an hour with uh, special uh, rotary test piece. So in this case, to achieve the speed, we used the turning lathe on a uh, sample that we had specially prepared with uh, sparker OD defects of uh, two and four millimeter uh, slots uh, deep. Um, and uh, in order to simulate the steel grade that is used for uh, modern rails, we use the 0.9% uh, carbon steel, which is not that far off from the 0.8% uh, 260 rail steel grade, which is currently used for manufacturing rails and installing it on the network. Even though some older rails may be 220 uh, grade, which is to uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 percent carbon max. So this is the rotary test piece, uh, four slots, two pairs, one pair two millimeters deep, the other pair four millimeters, that's the turning leaf. And on the bottom left hand side, you can see the pencil probe uh, that was used for the inspection. Here we did not look at the BZ uh, part of the signal, we only used the uh, 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 probe to assess the depth. So we were looking at just at the BX. And here you can see at 81 kilometers an hour and uh, at 20 and 121 kilometers an hour, the signal is remaining constant. So we don't have a degradation of uh, the signal uh, despite the changes in the speed. The same applies for the current testing. Unfortunately, if it was MFL, at this kind of speed, you would not have seen uh, much of a response, especially from the smaller defects. They would probably have disappeared altogether you might have been able to detect, uh, uh, but not reliably, the larger defects, uh, but in this case, we would have been uh, grossly underestimated them. And here is another set of uh, measurements at a constant speed of 81 kilometers an hour, but different liftoffs. So you can see at 0.8 millimeters, two, three, four, and five millimeters, uh, 
in all cases, the defects are successfully detected, even though the signal, as you can see, drops as we increase the lift of, but they are still detectable, and these are very small defects, as you can see. Uh, then we went on to test this on a high-speed uh, rotary rail rig with a set of rails that had been uh, pre prepared with a set of uh, spacker rotted samples, uh, spacker rotted slots, sorry, and uh, we repeated the tests up to uh, 50 kilometers an hour. Uh, so you can see here the uh, 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 sets of uh, tests for two different uh, speeds, 2.3 and 32 kilometers an hour. You can see the signal is uh, varying a little bit. This is because we couldn't keep the sensor at constant liftoff. So due to some variations, the uh, background signal varied accordingly. But even then, the signals were still uh, obtainable from the different defects. In conclusion, uh, what I discussed today was the main principles of MFL, eddy current testing and ACFM. Uh, as you have seen, they're useful tools for uh, various types of inspection and various types of uh, industrial uh, components. MFL and eddy current testing are designed for qualitative and semi-quantitative analysis. Eddy current testing is more uh, a semi-quantitative technique rather than qualitative. MFL, depending on how we inspect, can be more qualitative rather than semi-quantitative, but in any case, it will, they will not give you um, accurate value. They're ballpark uh, values that you can get. ACFM is designed to provide quantitative data, even though we can also use it for qualitative or semi-quantitative analysis. The quantitative analysis is based on the principle I mentioned earlier, so it uses a lookup table uh, that has already the calibration measurements that are accurately uh, defined for uh, uh, the materials that are typically inspected with ACFM. Uh, in uh, certain applications, we still need to combine these methods with other techniques, Typical, typically ultrasonic testing, especially when we want to get more accurate quantification of the defects we have detected. Uh, advances in signal processing and computational power has allowed us to use arrays more extensively, but uh, I must admit that over the last 20 years, the developments that we have seen in eddy current testing, ACFM and MFL, are not that great in comparison with what we were doing before. So it's largely uh, a very, they're all very reliable tools that have already been developed uh, to a very good level. And it's, uh, uh, that has led to only a limited amount of uh, further development so far which, uh, of course, uh, makes it more interesting to see what we will eventually be able to uh, get to uh, in uh, further improving these existing methods. And that's all I wanted to discuss today. If you have any questions, by all means. Thank you. Thank you, Mir, you know, so for the nice talk. Uh, any questions? A quick oh. question. Yeah, my... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Devale. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah Devale. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So... Uh, it's a wonderful presentation and it's such a uh, application oriented work so it will keep your um, there will not be any problem for funding for your group for many years <laughs> but looking uh, looking for uh, uh, time ahead mm -hmm. so i'm interested uh, about uh, i was studying a little bit about electric pulsing which can mm -hmm. um, uh, um, close the crack crack closure kind of things because yeah, yeah. Uh, you are doing these uh, non-destructive things for crack detection and crack propagation, but uh, can something be done yeah. to to close down the crack? Means the to completely eliminate the problem uh, altogether. Uh, so uh, have you thought this, about uh, it? This is this is this is an interesting uh, issue. So when you have uh, crack closure, that uh, can affect the measurement indeed. Uh, using pulses can uh, help uh, address the problem, but it is not a panacea because still you will have an effect from the closing crack. The idea of the pulsed, uh, 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 pulsed inspection is to try and to take the measurement while the crack uh, is uh, open again. So when you, you're talking about the fatigue environment, right? Am I correct? So you, where you yeah, have closing and opening, closing yeah. and opening. Yeah. So in, yeah, in that case, the idea is to yeah. pulse it at the right time so when you can still detect uh, the crack when it's fully open. And that means you don't have an electric circuit that affects 
the your uh, measurement and underestimating it. Uh, if it is uh, already free of load, then uh, the pulses uh, will not necessarily solve the problem because you still have uh, the crack closing uh, and uh, the two faces being in contact. So that will affect your measurement again. Okay, okay. So yeah, I was also thinking that if something can be done to change the microstructure at the vicinity of the crack, which will be quite strained by uh, some kind of uh, NDT technique. And uh, that, you're, you're, that talking can, about, you're talking yeah. about uh, the stress fields in the crack vicinity, yeah, right? Yeah, stress, stress that and is, strain that, fields. Well, I will, I will explain. Uh, there has been uh, Barkhausen noise measurements that have been used uh, for a number of years. And uh, these are looking at residual stress analysis based on the permeability right. variations. Uh, okay. These are very um, sensitive. It's a very sensitive technique, and it is very difficult to to develop the instrument and develop the analysis. Uh, so it's it's um, it's um, very weak signal, very low signal to noise ratio. So the stress field in the in the in the crack vicinity might be might, might have a very small effect to be detectable. For residual stresses, we are measuring the stress field uh, in a larger area, uh, so that affects the permeability in a larger uh, part of the of the sample that we are testing uh, immediately below the vicinity of the of the of the of the of the probe. Now, if we try to do this for a crack, a small crack. That would require sensitivity, which to my knowledge is not uh, possible with conventional means. I don't know if uh, using GMR or TMR, for example, whether the sensitivity would be adequate, but this would also be a function of how uh, thick the material is. And of course, in that case, we're talking about ferrous materials, which will have will have an effect from relative permeability. The relative magnetic permeability will also yeah. have um, uh, a contribution to the depth that we can achieve. So, it, if you are asking me, it is extremely difficult, uh, and uh, okay. it requires a very high level, very high level of sensitivity, which, to my knowledge, especially for industrial equipment, we don't have that uh, capability at the moment. For uh, research-related uh, inspections, there are lots of things that have happened, but uh, they are limited to the lab. Here I spoke okay. more from an industrial point of view and what right. the industry is currently doing. But yes, if you look right. for the literature, there are all kinds of uh, um, developments and uh, increased sensitivities that have been uh, demonstrated. But uh, the very few of these developments have been uh, uh, used outside uh, the lab. So they have been restricted to the lab. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Prakash. Good to see you, Debalai, yeah. by the way. It's really yeah. good to yeah, see you. Yeah, great to see you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, that's an interesting question uh, from Debalai. Yeah. And uh, I mean, as you also mentioned, how, how difficult to quantify residual stresses? Uh, it, 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 involves, uh, it involves by Bachhausen noise, as I, as I mentioned earlier. There's the company, a company in the UK called NAPS that specializes in this, and they have oh. been doing this for uh, several years. Uh, other people have attempted it. Um, it's not easy. That's uh, it's it's very sensitive measurements, very small variations. It's uh, it's an extremely complicated uh, process, uh, and uh, yeah, very very few people have managed to do this. So, what about microstructural uh, changes uh, and microstructural changes? Uh, that that uh, we, I mean, uh, in Birmingham uh, there has been work that has been done uh, with with uh, Claire Davis. Of course, uh, the Warwick team now is doing this. The colleagues in Manchester, which uh, were part of the original team, uh, working on this. So, microstructural changes, of course, uh, look at at the relative permeability variations that I mentioned earlier. And of course, they look at the uh, conductivity measurements when we are above the Curie temperature. So this is this is a very interesting application of eddy current testing, which is evolving with time. Uh, it is uh, requiring uh, more uh, specialized uh, analysis, uh, and the configuration of the sensors is different to what you would use for conventional uh, crack detection. Uh, that is 
what the industry predominantly employs. So it's a specialized dedicated application, which is, uh, uh, depending on what we're trying to detect, we're trying to quantify, uh, has different uh, requirements, different signal processing uh, needs to be implemented. And of course, you do need, uh, again, calibration measurements, as I mentioned earlier. So you do, you do need to compare against something in order to confirm how much phase uh, has transformed, how many sostenite has transformed to ferrite and perlite, or uh, if you had uh, other phases uh, being uh, included in the uh, microstructure such as martensite or bainite, uh, that uh, can also uh, complicate things because these microstructures will form much faster. So you mm -hmm. have very little time, and at the same time, your frequency is restricted uh, by the thickness you are trying to inspect. So if you are trying to do it, to do inspection on a plate, uh, obviously as the material transforms, the mm -hmm. thickness you are going through, uh, your magnetic field is going through, uh, is, begin, is, begin, is getting uh, lower. And if you lower your uh, frequency, you're lowering your sensitivity as well. And of course your sampling rate is affected as well. So yeah, okay. Okay, interesting, yeah. And a lot of applications as well, mm -hmm. which is uh, very good, yeah. Okay, uh, we don't have uh, many audience, so I don't think any more further may, questions. May, oh, Joshua, sure? yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. May please. I ask some more? Oh, one. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Marikinos, for uh, the informative talk. Um, I'm not from that area, so, so my question probably is quite naive. Um, uh, I think you, somewhere you talk about the uh, sort of the size limitation, it's 40 micrometer? For uh, GMR, this is the theoretical uh, sensitivity. Uh, ah, so it, okay. is not, it is not in the, in the field because GMR uh, can, affair, can, can um, uh, achieve much higher sensitivity than conventional uh, coils. So in comparison with coils, you can have a significantly better uh, sensitivity, which makes feasible detection of defects down to a few tens of microns. But these are theoretical values. They are not practical values, and it depends on uh, your experimental configuration. So okay. it's not uh, something you would be realistically trying to do in the field. So, so in the field, so, yeah. yeah. So when we talk about, you talk about defects, I, it's uh, my job with lots of like inclusion. So, Mm -hmm. uh, is inclusion considered as a defect of hard, uh, it, type it, it of defect or not? It, 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 dep it depends on your application. So there will be cases where you don't want any defects. And of course, yeah. uh, defects uh, of this type, uh, uh, such as inclusions, yeah. will give rise to changes in the permeability at local level and the yeah. conductivity. The problem is uh, whether these uh, inclusions uh, uh, are identifiable because they become part of the microstructure. Yeah. So it's not uh, it's not um, uh, uh, impossible to detect them because effectively a crack is uh, typically an area of uh, relative permeability which is equal to one because uh, it's free space effectively, and then you have uh, no conductivity as well. So in the case of the inclusion, typically these will be poor conductors depending on what the inclusion is, but typically they will be poor, poor conductors. And they will be uh, non-magnetic as well. So if they are okay. big enough, you can potentially detect them with uh, a very sensitive instrument. But it does depend on the surroundings because it's a different thing when it's on the surface and it's a different thing when they are hidden because yeah. you still have to go through the rest of the microstructure and that will affect how the flux is coming out again. So so if, if it's inclusion, okay. Um, you know the industries it's um it's really we we normally use like for the bar so we use mm -hmm. a ut to detect inclusion and the, if you use your sensor um can do the, i saw you, you, you in your slides you talk about the combinations with the ut mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is the uh, electromagnetic sensor can do the same lesson with the ut or uh, what's the size limit uh, uh, if you use the electromagnetic it, it, sensor to it, detect the inclusions? Well, it, we, norm we normally talk about if it's a 40 microns, so that's actually we call a marker inclusion. Uh, uh, we, we are probably more interested about uh, a 10 micron inclusion. Can you detect well, or not? Ma ma micro would be uh, uh, not feasible with the existing equipment unless you have a very thin uh, if it's a very thin component, like coating, uh, 
yeah. then uh, you might be able to do something, but it depends on the design. So you're talking, you're going to the realms of develop, research and development again. Uh, so you're talking about uh, developing a specialized uh, probe, which is designed for that particular application. Uh, typical inclusions of that, of that size uh, would not be detectable, not with a coil. Uh, okay. The, okay. The, the conventional equipment uh, usually has a sensitivity of one to two millimeters, depending on the coil size that you have. So if you have uh, coils with one meter, one millimeter diameter, you cannot expect to find anything smaller than that. So ah, usually okay. the smaller diff will be will be just larger than one millimeter. So anything okay. below that will not be detectable anymore. Okay, thanks. Thanks. That's very mm -hmm. clear. Thank you so much.